uh, thanks again. Um, thanks again so much, Benson, and, and for all of you there. I really wish I could be with you guys, youth guys. I miss you. Uh, miss hanging out with you and, and just talking about life. Um, it's weird now, I know. I uh, really wish we, I could be with you all. Um, one thing I do not miss, though, is how how crazy that gym sounds. So hopefully the <laughs> sound is better here coming through your computer. Uh, in any case, uh, again, I want to say thank you to Pastor Barry, to Wesley, and all the leaders through OIG and ECHO. It's always uh, fun for me to come and, and share God's word with you and worship together with you. Um, I want to thank Tiffany for that uh, for that testimony, and I think it sums up so well so much of what people are going through um, what they have been going through for years um, and so I do want to encourage us in this time to continue to to to, to stand up against racism uh, to, to acknowledge those that have been suffering because of racism um, to look to our neighbors and look at the people around us and with compassion and empathy to affirm that black lives do matter and that things need to change in this country, that justice needs to be um, developed further in this country. And that happened, that should happen, should be led by people within the church. Uh, we have a God who, of justice, who desires justice, um, who wants to see those wrongs addressed and wants to, um, you know, we, we have wants to meet everybody's needs. And so we, we are his hands and his feet. And I do want to encourage uh, all of you who weren't here for our message last week to take a look at that. I think Paul's words about humility from Philippians chapter two are really powerful for our day today. Um, this call to stand up, uh, to be other centered, to seek, actively seek others good instead of our own. Uh, is something that is countercultural, countercultural to everything in this world, um, no matter where you stand. And so often, unfortunately, I see many Christians uh, quick to defend themselves and their own interests and slow to reach out with compassion and humility to seek the interests of others. And I'd hope that we as a church uh, do that and we don't shy away from that. They're, these are hard times, I understand. But I also want to encourage us that in these hard times, whether it's because of the pandemic or whether it's because of, uh, you know, these issues that are coming up because of the death of George Floyd and so many others, uh, we have to remember that God is present here with us. He has not left us. Uh, he is not surprised by any of what is happening. He is here and he is working in this moment. He is faithful and he is good and he has been and he will be through the easy times and through the hard times. So we as Christians, we look at this, this uh, situation, we're not surprised. Uh, Jesus never promised us a comfortable life. We're never promised that we'll always be happy or that things will always be great, but we are promised that he will be with us in every circumstance, that we will never have to face these circumstances on our own, in our own strength. In fact, we are called to depend on the Lord to put our trust in him and to step out as a witness um, to serve, uh, to serve our communities, uh, to be people who don't fear, but respond with faith and, um, and continuing to live that out in our lives. So before we open up, let me pray for God's help for us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace to us this morning. Uh, we come with heavy hearts or maybe just a lot of burdens, but we know, God, that you are more than enough to help us carry these burdens and to uh, strengthen us, to encourage us to sober um, thinking and consideration about you know, our own sins uh, and our own um, inaction and our own lack of humility. Uh, but God, I pray that you would uh, allow us in this time to be encouraged, to persevere, to press forward into, into Christ. In this time, Lord, especially in these days, may we not be afraid, but may we continue to persevere, uh, press forward, grow in our relationship with you, and live that out uh, in the communities that we are in. We thank you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I want to turn, turn to uh, 
just a really interesting story here that I think will sum up a little bit of what we're talking about this morning. It involves a, a man named Hagos Geberwet. I think I pronounced his name right. Hagos Geberwet. And Hagos Geberwet is a world championship distance runner from uh, Ethiopia. He is de highly decorated. I think he won a bronze in the last Olympics. Um, and his specialty is the 5,000 meter, which is uh, mostly indoor, but some outdoor as well. But he does track running at 5,000 meters. And there's a story about Hagos Geberwet where he's running uh, this race in Luzon in Switzerland. And he's running and he's running. And as he's running, uh, he uh, is, he sees the finish line and he's, he's running really hard. He wants to finish really well. He's ahead of the pack. He looks like he's going to, uh, you know, finish with a clear win. And so as he runs, he runs, he runs, and then he crosses the finish line. And you would think at that moment, he would, you know, there would be cheering, there'd be the sound of bells, there'd be, you know, announcers saying, you know, this is the champion, but there was none of that. You see what happened with Hagos Geberwet is that he still had one more lap to run. He had miscounted, and as he was running and running and running, he thought he had one lap less than he actually had to run, and so he ended up finishing early. <laughs> or at least in his mind, finishing the race one lap too early. And so as he realized this, as the rest of the runners caught up with him and passed him, he realized that he had not actually finished the race. He had been one lap too short. And so he bolted and he still made 10th place at the very end. But I think this, the story of Hagos Geberwet is illustrative of our need to finish well, our need to know the race we're running and to finish well, not to finish too early or not to, uh, you know, have the wrong idea. And it, it's really, it's really interesting that, you know, someone, even someone like this well, highly decorated professional runner would make a mistake like this, but here we are. It's so important for us to finish well, whether it's a race, um, whether it's school, or, or whether it's in any other area of life. And so as we uh, open our Bibles or turn on our Bibles to Philippians 3, let me catch us up to where we are and, and show, show you how this all fits together. See, in the past two weeks in Echo, uh, we've been walking through the letter to the Philippians. And that's what we're, hopefully what we're, we'll be doing is uh, walking through this for this week and next week, we'll be continuing on and finishing Philippians. But we've been walking through Philippians, and Paul is writing this letter to a church that is enduring hard times. They are suffering from opposition outside. They have enemies outside who are who are making life difficult for them. People inside are fighting and dividing them. There's internal division, uh, arguments, and so Paul is writing to this church. He's writing to them from his own difficult situation from prison. But the purpose of the letter is to encourage. So Paul wants to encourage this church in the midst of their own suffering, in the midst of their own difficulty, to remind them of the hope they have in Jesus and what that means for them in their situation. As we turn here to Philippians chapter 3, Paul is beginning the end of his letter. And he begins with this word about his own life. He turns to himself. He starts giving his own testimony. And here he, he gives a statement about the things that are most important to him. So Philippians chapter 3 is kind of like Paul's personal statement. For those of us who've done college applications recently or have been applying to grad school or really just applying to any job, we have these personal statements we need to make about what we're all about or about, you know, the things that we've done and what we're really interested in. This is Paul's personal statement here in Philippians chapter 3. And in verses 4 to 7, before we get to our passage, Paul lists all these personal accomplishments that he has, everything that he could take credit for himself. This is his resume. You know, Paul has the right pedigree. He comes from the right kind of family. He has the right education. He has the right uh, religious training. He has the respect of social leaders, political leaders, religious leaders. He seems to have done everything right. He's um, the equivalent of like a PhD from Harvard for the kind of guy he is, and he did them all well. But Paul's conclusion at the end of this resume is this, that all of these things are worthless. All these things that I could count for myself, they're worthless. Why? 
Because for Paul, the greatest thing in life is Christ and to know Christ. Compared to Jesus, everything else for Paul is like garbage. He's not saying it is garbage, but he's like, Jesus is so much greater in my eyes and my life. To me, Jesus is so much more valuable. And it's like all these other things, which other people would think are really valuable, are like worthless garbage. Paul's entire life is centered around Jesus, living to know Jesus, seeking to to go deeper in his relationship with Jesus. And that's why in verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, as garbage, in order that I may gain Christ. That Paul is willing to say, you know, all these other things, I'll be willing to lose it all. And I have lost it all, a lot of it, all this respect that I had from these people, all this fame, all this training, all these degrees. I I, have lost all the prestige, all of the fame, because the most important thing to me is Jesus. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worth more than anything. And that's why there's no one else worth living for. But Paul also recognizes this, that living for Jesus, that even if you have this viewpoint, and I hope that you see that, that that's, that's how you look at life too. But, Jesus, but, but, but Paul recognizes that living for Jesus as a follower of Jesus is not easy. We see this, right? Even in our day to day, living for Jesus is not easy. So in the passage this morning, Paul shares with the Philippians what keeps him going despite all of his hardships. Again, Paul is in prison now. Now he could easily give up and no one would blame him. People would say, while he's in prison, of course he would give up, but Paul doesn't give up. Paul sees he still has a race to run. There's more for him to do. So Paul tells the Philippians, I'm still going to run this race, but this is how I do it. And so these are the words that Paul is giving to us where we are right now, whether we're suffering, um, you know, just mental distress from what's going on in the country, from the pandemic financial distress, even relational distress, not being able to meet with friends and family, and that has put pressure on our hearts and and made us either lonely or fearful. Paul is showing us how to keep on going despite what we are going through. Paul encourages the Philippians to be faithful, to, to keep on going for the long haul. So as Christians, we don't only think about today, but we also keep our eyes forward. We're running a race. This is not a short distance race. This is a long distance race. This is a marathon. And so uh, we're going to look at Paul's words here. But the really the, the, the main idea here is that for Paul, because of Christ, because of who Christ is and what Christ has done, we persevere till the end. Because of Christ, we persevere till the end. And Paul does, it gives us a two two-pronged approach to how to persevere. That's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's look at uh, the first verse there, uh, verse 12. And Paul is pointing out, has already talked about his life, right? And he's very quick in verse 12 to first say that, you know, I'm still working on this. And so I want to preface all of what we're talking about here, the, the two-pronged approach to perseverance, that this is something that is lived out across your whole life. For Paul, it was something that he was still working on, still living into, even when he was writing this letter. So it wasn't something that he um, already understood. It wasn't something that he already knew. It was something that he was learning alongside the Philippians as well. But looking at verse 13 here, then, is the first, um, first part of what it means to persevere to the end. The first part is this to forget what lies behind. To persevere to the end, we must forget what lies behind. Paul's been pointing to his own life, like I said, right? His past life, everything that he has lived. But now Paul is saying, I'm in Christ. Now I know Jesus. I live for Jesus. So he calls us first to forget what lies behind. What does this mean? Does this mean that we just forget the past? Does it mean we just don't think about the things that we did before or you know, we kind of like have this kind of amnesia that means we just forget everything. 
We don't even consider it? No. What Paul says when he says forgetting what lies behind is this. He means leaving the past behind. Now that means leaving behind past sins, past failures, old ways of thinking, and old and past priorities. This doesn't mean we forget the past. It doesn't mean we don't learn from our mistakes. It doesn't mean that we pretend that the past didn't happen. But Paul wants to highlight in this first step of perseverance is that we need to, in Jesus, your past does not define you any longer. And so we leave it behind. Remember that before he met Jesus, Paul was a persecutor and murderer of Christians himself, right? He remembers his past sins. In the past, Paul lived his life in the way he saw fit. He lived his life fighting against Jesus. But then he met Jesus, and that all changed. So when all these thoughts come, when all these thoughts of past sins and failures and what he used to be come, what does Paul do? Paul turns his eyes to Jesus. Paul remembers what Jesus has done for him, that Christ has taken all his sin, all his shame, and nailed it to the cross. Paul remembers that in Christ he is a new creation. His old life is gone and his new life has come. So when you put your faith in Jesus, you are forgiven and free. Your failures and weaknesses and sins and everything that, you know, that tells you that you aren't worthy, they no longer define you. Forgetting what lies behind also means that we take on a new way of life. All those old ways of thinking about ourselves and all those old priorities we had, pursuing our own glory, getting things for ourselves, building a reputation for ourselves, all those things go away. We forget them. We put them aside. Instead of letting fear and despair grip us, instead of being trapped by our sins or being controlled by them, we are free from them. They no longer define us, and we are free to live into this new life that Jesus has given to us. What does it mean? What happens when you don't forget what lies behind? I think the best picture of this actually comes from my own life. Now, I remember in sixth grade, the first day I went to school, and um, for many of us here, you know, especially for the youth, uh, this was before we had Chromebooks, before we had iPads, before we had smartphones. These were the days of paper textbooks. And if you've ever seen those paper textbooks, those old dusty things on the shelves uh, inside your parents' house or inside the libraries, you know that many of them were very big and very thick. They were made with this very heavy paper and cardboard. They're meant to last years. But every beginning of school year, uh, as a student, you would receive the textbooks that you were going to use throughout the year, and you were to take them home or keep them you know, in your locker so that you could do uh, your homework. Now, the first day of school was the worst. Why? Because you had to take all of those books home at once. And it wasn't just, here's a book, and the next day they give you another book. There's these books that are like three, four inches thick. They're like really heavy. And so you put them all in your bag and you lug them all home. Now, on the first day of school is also the day that I got my bus pass. I didn't take a yellow bus to school. I'm in New York City, they do give um, public transportation passes to students so that they can get home uh, from school. And so I had this public transportation pass and I had this giant bag full of books. And so I get on this bus, I take it to my stop, and I get, to, I get off on my stop. And the first thing I do is check my pockets to make sure that I have my bus pass. Because if I lose this bus pass, I'm going to have to pay for it, uh, pay a lot for it. It's going to take a lot to get that replaced. So I check my pockets. It's not in my right pocket. Okay. I don't usually use that one. It's not in my left pocket. Well, I don't, I don't know. I must have put it in my back pocket. It's not there either. I check my bag. I must have put it in my bag after I sat down with this heavy bag of books. It's not there. The realization dawns on me that I have left the bus pass on the bus. And as I'm realizing this, the bus is, the door of this New York City bus has closed and is pulling away to pull off to the next stop, which is about four or five blocks down the way. So what do I do? Well, the only thing that I could do, first I cry out, stop, stop. Bus driver doesn't hear me. So I start to run. Now I start to run and I realize that I have this book bag on my back full of heavy textbooks. I run. 
But as I run, it's like running in slow mo. I feel like I'm running in slow motion or running with cement on my feet. I, I can't get the speed I need to catch up with this bus. I know I could catch up with it if only I didn't have this bag. And so what do I do? Knowing that if I don't, I would never reach the bus, take this bag off and throw it onto someone's yard. And I start running and sprinting. And at the very last moment, I catch up to that bus at the bus stop. Sweat dripping down my face. I step into the bus. I ask the bus driver, I think I left my bus pass on there. And there it was, right on the seat that I had been sitting in not a few minutes before. And as I got off of that bus with my bus pass and walked back to pick up my books, I realized that, you know, man, that bag of books, that was the only thing keeping me from catching, getting my bus pass. But this is what happens if we don't leave the past behind. We are weighed down. We are not free to run as we should, even run as we need in the moment. And some of us have past sins, past failures, past pains, and it's like a burden on our backs that keep us from moving forward. Some of us still think we can live our lives on our own terms. Some of us, it's difficult to leave our past behind. We'll struggle, yes, but Paul says that even in the midst of the struggle, we have to remember what Jesus has done and leave all of these things behind because Jesus has freed us from them. When we are confronted with our past, we look to Jesus and remember that he's freed us. When we're tempted by our old life to get glory for ourselves or live for ourselves, trust ourselves more, we put these things behind us. Christ reminds us that we no longer belong to ourselves anymore. We are free from the past and we are free to leave it behind. So to persevere from the end, we must forget what lies behind. That's the first thing. And secondly, to persevere to the end, there's a second part here is we must press on towards the goal. To persevere to the end, we must press on towards the goal. So persevering isn't just about leaving things behind. In the same breath, Paul emphasizes that perseverance is about pressing forward, running hard. We aren't just leaving the old life behind. We're running towards Jesus. And that, that's, a, that's a really good picture of Paul paints here. It's a picture of an athletic contest, a race, uh, with, a, with a starting line and a finish line. And when runners enter a race, for those of you guys here, I know a lot of you are runners, um, that they you run with intention. You run with a purpose. You run, you want to, first of all, you want to finish. But second, you want to do as best as you can. You want to win. Um, they want to finish first. Hopefully you want to finish first. You want to help your team finish first. So what does it take to win? What does Paul mean when he talks about pressing forward and running hard? I think the central thing that Paul uh, is emphasizing here is that Persevering runners are not distracted. Now, when I think about distraction, I think about um, a character from the movie Up. Now, you, you guys know uh, the dog from Up? His name was Doug. D-U-G, Doug the dog. Now, Doug the dog belonged actually to the bad guy of this movie. And uh, he has this fun collar uh, that translates his dog barks into human speech, into English. So uh, one of the funny things that is kind of common with Doug is that he's always distracted. He's, he's in the middle of something. He's so eager to do something. He's, he's going to help his, uh, he's going to help his master do something. He's going to help his other dog friends do something. He's smelling. He's trying to figure out how to do it. And then squirrel, squirrel, he's distracted in the middle of what he's doing. He sees a squirrel and immediately his mind just goes to the squirrel, no matter what happens. And it's kind of funny because throughout the entire uh, movie, at the worst possible moment, Doug is distracted by a random squirrel. But that's often what it's like in our lives, right? When we're living for Jesus, we get so distracted by things so quickly too, right? We get distracted by life. We get distracted by what's going on 
Um, outside, we get distracted by what's going on on our phones. We get distracted what's going on at work and in life. And so all of these things seem to get in the way, oftentimes, of keeping our eyes on Jesus. What are some of the things that keep us from pressing on to the goal? You know, it's a lot of different things, but I think there are four central things that are at the bottom of a lot of our distractions. And these, this isn't like a comprehensive list, but when I see in my life and many people's lives, uh, these are the four things that often are distractions from keeping our eyes on Jesus. And the first thing is perfectionism. Some of us struggle with perfectionism in school or in life or in family. We want to attain to this particular uh, way of living. We want this, uh, we think life should look a certain way to us. And so we, so we are so desperately seeking that, um, you know, for many of our families, uh, this attainment of perfection, meaning you want to like look a certain way or, or live life in a certain way is so important. That's why so many, um, you know, parents are so eager to ask their kids, tell their kids to be doctors or lawyers or things like that. You know, they want to be, they want to have this perfect picture of this perfect family. Um, and that's next thing is not just perfectionism, but comfort. Sometimes we struggle with comfort, the desire to live a comfortable life. We want to avoid hardship. We want to go the easy route. And we think that Jesus, if we follow Jesus, then we should be entitled to an easy life, but he never promised us that. But comfort oftentimes will distract us from following Jesus. Thirdly, fear. Fear keeps us, fear distracts us from following Jesus. We're filled with doubt, we're filled with panic, we're filled with despair. The circumstances overwhelm us and we freeze up or we start to go frantic and try to figure out how to fix things or we trust ourselves. We look at ourselves in the mirror and we don't go, you know, I need God's help right now. We go, I can do this by myself. And we trust our own wisdom and our own strength. And it keeps our eyes from, from Jesus. And lastly, maybe the most common thing that all of us struggle with, I struggle with it for sure, is pride. Pride keeps our eyes away from Jesus. We're distracted by ourselves. See, pride isn't just, I think I'm better than other people. Pride is, I think of myself. I don't think of anybody else. Pride is pri privileging ourselves and our comforts and our views and our thoughts and everything before others. When Jesus himself, we talked about last week in Philippians 2, calls us to take on the interests of others and to serve others. We become the center of our own world. So don't be distracted by these things. Don't be distracted by perfectionism. We'll never be perfect. Comfort. Jesus never promises us a comfortable life if we follow him. Fear. Jesus frees us from fear and pride. Don't be distracted by putting ourselves at the center of the world. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. All of these things will only lead to emptiness, despair, and death. But Paul urges the Philippians, and he's urging us to keep our eyes on the real prize, and that's Jesus himself. Pressing forward, pressing on towards the goal, also means that we keep on going even when things get hard. Paul's own life is also a testimony to this. We press forward. We're going to face challenges. It's not an if, but a when. Jesus never promised us an easy life. And so we're, we're not, we, we, we shouldn't expect smooth sailing and calm seas. In fact, Jesus promised us that if we live for him, life will be challenging sometimes, especially a lot of times. It'll be uncomfortable at times to follow him. You know, it may mean that we are made fun of or misunderstood by other people. It may mean we have to give up things or make sacrifices that are uncomfortable for us. At the very least, living for Jesus will force us to have a completely different view of our lives and our world. But you ask, so how can I do all this? It seems like a lot. Perseverance, forgetting what lies behind and pressing onto this goal, it seems like a lot, Jeff. How can I do this? What is Paul asking of me? Well, in the last words of verse 14, Paul reminds us that God himself calls us to persevere, right? This upward call of God in Jesus Christ, that God has called us, but he's not just called us to this kind of life, but he has made it possible for us to live this life in Jesus himself. So Jesus is both the prize the goal, the finish line that we seek right there. We, we press on towards the goal for the prize that is Christ. But yet at the same time, the upward call of God is 
is made real in our lives because of Jesus. He is the prize and he is the power for us to persevere. So when things get tough, we turn to Christ. When we feel weary, we turn to Christ. When we face temptation or trial, we can turn to Christ and receive strength and empowerment. This is the gospel that it's not our efforts, right? That it's not our efforts that have purchased us victory over death and sin. It's not our efforts that purchase us eternal life. It is Jesus himself, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, who he is, Jesus has come and won for us new life and freedom and forgiveness. And so it doesn't change when we become Christians. As Christians, we continue to put our trust in Jesus to give us the strength to persevere. So to persevere to the end, we must press on to the goal. We are all called to perseverance. And this means forgetting what lies behind and pressing on towards the goal. But let me uh, make one last note here is this. Paul is writing this letter to a community. And I really want to emphasize that perseverance is not just an individual thing. I know it's really hard to think about that because we're all stuck in our homes. And, you know, I only see individual screens here. But when living for Jesus is not just a, a lone ranger uh, ad adventure. It's not about just you and God. A lot of times uh, people will think, oh, it's just about me and Jesus and nobody else. No. Paul is writing this letter to a community. And when he's calling them to perseverance, he's calling them to perseverance together. Perseverance is not centrally about doing this ourselves, but doing this together with the community, with the family of Jesus in our churches. And, and so none of us are alone, right? And so in OIG, when we continue to affirm that we're all in this together, it really is the reality of our lives as Christians. We are all in this together. That's what Jesus is calling us to do, live a life together. So Paul writes this to this church to encourage them to pursue perseverance together. It's not just about me or an individual, but it's about a community coming together, focusing on Jesus together, forgetting what lies behind together and pressing on towards the goal together. So I encourage you all, be in your small groups, be in each other's lives, let others into your life. It's important. Because of what Christ has done for us, and he brings us into this family. He frees us from our pasts, our sin. He empowers us to, to press on towards the goal. And so because of Christ, we persevere to the end. And as I end, let me offer three quick applications for us. Some questions for us to think about as we consider what Paul is saying here. First is personal, some personal questions. What are some things in your past that you need to leave behind? What are some old sins or, or things you've struggled with or mistakes you've made in the past and you think, you know, I, Jesus could never love me. Jesus could never use me. That These things will always be with me. No. In Christ, we are free from those things. And though they may take time to be free, we are free today and we are being made free. And so we shouldn't see ourselves as being held back by our past. But at the same time, what are those things that distract us, that keep us from turning our eyes to Jesus, that keep us from pressing on to the goal? We got to look at our own hearts and our own lives. What are those, those things that, that turn our eyes away from Jesus as we're running this race? Again, is it our perfectionism, our desire for comfort? Is it our fear? Is it our pride? So that's personal questions to ask ourselves individually. But again, not, it's not just an individual thing. There is a, a community that we are part of. And so we need to ask ourselves as a community, what are ways that we as a church can encourage each other to persevere? Now, I know I'm speaking to youth and adults, but what are some ways that we can encourage each other, youth to adults and adults to youth, to continue to live for Jesus. These aren't just words, but these are also the way we live our lives. Are we known as a community that encourages each other to persevere? Or do we often operate like a church like of ships passing in the night? We're all in the same bay. We're all in the same uh, part of the water, but we don't even see each other. We act like the other isn't even there. Paul's calling us to be a community of encouragement to perseverance, to persevere together. And lastly is this. 
to echo Paul's first words from this passage. Are we a community that shows the infinite value of living for Jesus over everything else? Do our lives point to the infinite value of Jesus in our lives, or do we only play the part? Paul's words urge us away from a lip service level of faith, which is defined by minimal effort. I'm a Christian because I just go to church. I'm a Christian because I read my Bible. I'm a Christian because I pray every day. No, Paul is, is clear that our, 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 our relationship with Jesus, yes, involves those things, but those things are meant to live to a, a life of perseverance that showed forth as a witness to the world. And that's why he's writing these things to the Philippians, because they're trying to be faithful witnesses in a world that is so often against them. They're trying to live faithfully for Jesus, to show the world the infinite value and surpassing greatness of Jesus, his love, his mercy, what he's done for us. And our lives as a church community, as individuals, should show that out, that our, we should point to Jesus in everything that we do. We should live to reflecting Jesus to everyone that we meet. Our perseverance is not just, you know, something we do as Christians within the four walls of the church, but it is something we do with our whole lives. So I hope, Living Water, that as we go through these times, that we will persevere till the end, putting our trust in Jesus, remembering that he's freed us from our past, remembering that he's strengthened us to persevere, and doing that together doing that actively, going into our communities, engaging, being the hands and feet of Christ, showing our perseverance to a world in need of saving, in need of the gospel. I hope that we're able to do that together, not just in these days, not just in times of great turmoil or uncertainty, but in, in every day, whether days are good or bad, my prayer is that living water, Echo OIG, the Chinese congregation, the children, that we will all see the surpassing value and greatness of Jesus and will be strengthened and empowered to persevere so that the world will know. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love for us, for us as sinners, that though we don't deserve it, you love us and you provide for us. But God, we also um, confess, Lord, that we are so distracted by so many different things in this world. We're distracted by our pride, by our comfort, by our fear, by our perfectionism. And so it becomes difficult, Lord, to either leave past behind or press forward. But God, I, I do pray that you would empower each one of us to keep our eyes on you, to remember what you've done for us, Lord, that you have freed us from our old selves the past no longer defines us, but God, that you have also given us strength, freedom to run to Christ, to keep our eyes on him. And through that, we are strengthened and empowered and filled with your love and mercy and are able to then go and meet people who are hurting to show the gospel, not just in word, but in deed. To be the hands and feet of Christ to this world. To persevere under suffering. Not out of fear or out of pride or out of um, in the selfishness, but out of humility, showing Christ the surpassing value, placing aside everything else so that others may see him in us. We thank you, Father, for your grace this time. Make us a people who persevere for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>